Hi guys, welcome back to yet another fun DIY sailboat refit video here aboard good old Athena. This is part three and hopefully the final part in the hydronic diesel heater series. If you haven't seen part one and two yet, I highly recommend you check those out before watching this video. All that's left to do is to hook up the exhaust, fill the system with coolant, and wire up the PFC, the Pro Heat Function Controller, and the thermostat. At the end of this video, I'll answer some of the more common questions I've gotten over the last couple of videos. Of course, I won't have used the Pro Heat X30 for any kind of considerable amount of time, so I won't really be able to tell you what I think about that yet, but I will be able to tell you why you might want to go with a setup like this compared to something more simple like a Dickinson or Reflex stove. There are pros and cons to both types of setups, I've spent the last six years living on a 30-foot sailboat with a reflex stove as my only heat source, so I feel like I'm qualified to at least share my opinion on that. But uh, yeah, we'll uh, get back to that at the end of this video. For the ProHeat X30, I've got this optional marine installation kit, and I believe that also came with this marine heater exhaust kit. Now that kit comes with some of this flexible exhaust hose. This is one and a half inch. It also came with a condensation loop or a condensation trap that I fitted to the heater in one of the previous videos. And it also came with this exhaust through hole. The installation instructions that came with the marine heater exhaust kit are very thorough. And that is really nice because the exhaust is gonna get insanely hot and I would much prefer not to set fire to the boat. In last week's video, I drilled this ginormous hole here in the transom for the exhaust through hull. The hole saw I used was a tiny bit on the small side. According to the installation instructions, there needs to be an air gap of about three millimeters around the exhaust through hull. And I think I have about one and a half millimeter. So I'm gonna have to enlarge this hole just a tiny bit. This little guy should make short work of that. It shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes. I will go ahead and call that perfect. With the exhaust through hull comes this high temperature silicone gasket that is apparently very important to help protect the hull from the heat. I've got the silicone gasket on here, so let's get the exhaust through hull in place. In the delightfully cramped cockpit locker, I secured the exhaust through hull, but seeing how dark this footage is, I think I'm just gonna hold off until tomorrow when we've got some more daylight to install the rest of the exhaust so that you guys can actually see what I'm doing. There are still a few things I can take care of here inside of the boat where there's better lighting, like for instance, finishing this exciting looking contraption here. Adding this contraption to the plumbing was recommended to me by a viewer named Patrick. Now, if you want a sexier version than what I'm building here, Shore Marine, which is the website where I've purchased the fan heaters and the tanks, they do offer something that's a lot smaller than this and serves the same purpose but it's for the US market, so the threading is all wrong for me because I'm based in Europe. Why is it a good idea to add this lump of fittings to the system? Well, because this will allow me to fill the system with coolant from one of the lowest points going up, rather than just pouring coolant into the expansion tank. That should get less air trapped in the system, meaning it'll be easier to air out. And with this, I should probably also be able to circulate the coolant throughout the system without running the circulation pump on the X30. A little later in this video, you guys will hopefully get to see this contraption in action. I'm going to add this on either this side or this side of the first heat exchanger. I'm sure somebody's gonna comment saying, but wait, mess, you could have used a three-way valve instead of these two valves. And yes, that's true, but all the three-way valves I could find over here were horrendously expensive. We're talking the equivalent of $100, whereas one of these is the equivalent of $4. Real quick, the way this is gonna work is these ends up here are gonna get connected to the existing plumbing in the system. The two ends down here are gonna go to a big bucket. One of them is gonna have a pump on it. That bucket is gonna get filled with coolant. And then we're gonna close this valve here and run coolant all the way through the system back to the bucket. I got another bit of advice in the comment section and that was that air might get trapped in my beautiful looking manifolds. 
So that is why I'm just going to make a little bit of a swapperoo and put these little guys in. At the end of each of these are a little screwy doodaddy that you can open and that'll let air out of the manifolds. On each of the heaters is something that serves the same purpose. This is open and closed with this little key. And the same key will open a vent right there on the top of the buffer tank. By adding these little air leddy outy thingies to the manifolds, I'm hoping I'll have a much easier time getting any air that's gonna get trapped in here out of there. It would certainly have been easier to add this to the manifolds before putting them in place, but uh, well, you live, you learn. That's about half an hour's worth of boat yoga. As you can see, the two airy venti thingies are now in place. There's one last little safety item I can get checked off the to-do list tonight before I get ready to fire up the X30 this weekend. And that is to fit a carbon monoxide alarm and a smoke detector. These are nothing fancy. They're the exact same models you'd put in your house. I think the smoke detector was the equivalent of $10 and the carbon monoxide alarm was, well, maybe $20. This thing has a little display that cycles between temperature and parts per million. That's pretty cool. In comparison, the smoke detector is pretty dang boring. No display, no nothing. My plan is to put a set of these in the technical compartment and then another set here in the saloon. I can't really mount these perfectly in the technical compartment, but I figured having them in there is better than nothing. <laughs> This is a temporary mounting situation. It's the best I can do for now. I am gonna move these in the not too distant future. It's a new glorious day. I've spent a little bit of time off camera trying to figure out the wiring situation. I think I've finally seen the light, but uh, we will find out tomorrow. Today, I wanna take advantage of the little bit of daylight that's left and get the exhaust all sorted out. I've already trimmed this stainless steel double-walled flexible exhaust hose to length, but I do have a small correction for last week's video. In last week's video, I think I might have mentioned that this silicone-covered insulation sleeve that's gonna go over the flexible exhaust is a part of the marine installation kit. It is not. It's something you're gonna have to buy in addition to the marine installation kit. I think you might be able to get by without this insulation sleeve, but there's certainly no harm in adding it. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. I don't know how much the sleeve is actually gonna insulate the exhaust, but I like the fact that it's silicone coated so that it'll keep dirt and grime off of the exhaust. There are two different types of clamps included with the marine installation kit. There are three of this type, I think, and a single one of this type. And this one here is supposed to be used where the exhaust through hull meets that little piece of stainless steel tube that adapts it so that it can fit onto the flexible exhaust. I don't know what happened to my GoPro, but the footage from the cockpit locker is basically useless. So we'll take a quick peek at the exhaust tomorrow. Now there's only two things left to take care of with the exhaust and then that is done. The first one is to fit this little condensation drain that's gonna go right down here. And there we go. I picked up this little bit of extra insulation to wrap around the condensation drain and that is the very last piece of the exhaust puzzle. With the little bit of extra insulation here in place, the exhaust is now Done. While we're on the topic of the exhaust, I picked up this little guy from Shore Marine. I think he's kind of neat. It's a little plug for the exhaust through hole that you just pop in there. You spin this little guy, the rubber part expands, and that should keep water out of your exhaust. Of course, we can't use this little guy while running the heater, but in case we ever need to, now it's super easy for us to just seal off the exhaust. It's the next day, and let's start out by taking a quick peek at the exhaust here in the cockpit logger that I didn't get to show you yesterday because of that wrecked GoPro footage. Please excuse the dirt and grime in here. I, I do need to tidy up a little bit, but uh, here is the exhaust exiting out the bulkhead. The heater is right on the other side of this bulkhead. The exhaust goes up, it is secured to the hull. Earlier this week, I epoxy to place some little pieces of plywood to secure the exhaust to the hull. It goes up and it goes in a big loop up here and comes down to the exhaust through hull. Do you guys know that feeling when you order something online and in your head you've got an idea of how big it is and then it shows up and it's a completely different size? Well, I ordered a pump online to help put coolant in the system 
And this little thing showed up. In my mind, this little thing was at least four times bigger than this, but uh, yeah. Hopefully you'll do. I've hooked up the contraption from a little earlier in this video. Now the extra bunch of hose you see in this locker is just so that I can pull everything out of the locker because at some point in the spring when the weather is a little bit nicer, I need to glass this false bottom in place and get everything painted. So yeah, don't uh, worry about this looking a little bit messy for now. At the other end of these two clear PVC hoses is a big bucket. That is gonna get filled with coolant and to this side I'm gonna add a pump. I'll leave this ball valve open and that ball valve open and this one closed. That'll force the coolant all the way through the entire system and then back to the bucket. Because we are in the middle of winter, there is no water here on the pontoons. So I'm gonna have to bring water in bottles in and mix that with the concentrated coolant to fill the system. That's gonna take a while, but that's okay. I just really hope I don't find any leaks. To run my enormously powerful pump, I'm gonna use one of Adina's old house bank batteries. That is also what's gonna run the heater, but uh, we'll get back to that hopefully a little bit later in this video. Whoa, I was kind of kidding when I said enormously powerful, but that little thing is, uh, well, pretty awesome it seems like. The mic is not gonna pick it up, but I can hear the coolant slushing around in the system. This is very exciting. Look at the PEX tube on the bottom manifold. You can see the coolant running through there now. And we can also see that the PEX tube has turned blue from the color of the coolant here at the first fan heater. Oh, see the coolant coming back to the bucket? I'm gonna leave the pump running until there are no more air bubbles coming out. The pump has been running for a few minutes and as you can see, there are no more air bubbles. I don't know if there's still air trapped somewhere in the system, but at least there aren't any more air bubbles. I've turned off the pump and I've closed this valve and this valve. Now I'm gonna open this center one here to allow coolant to pass through the system when I turn on the heater. There's plenty of coolant in the expansion tank, but I imagine there might still be some air trapped in the buffer tank. I'm not sure the mic is gonna pick it up, but I can hear a little bit of air hissing out of here. Air is coming out here and the coolant is slowly dropping in the expansion tank. So yeah, we definitely have a little bit of air trapped in here. There turned out to be quite a bit of air in the buffer tank, which makes sense because both of the connections come in at the bottom. So of course there's gonna be air trapped in there. But at that point in time, I'd already disconnected the filling contraption. So I just decided to use the little pump and top off the expansion tank and uh, well now there should be no more air in the buffer tank. When I turn the little key up here now all that comes out is just a little bit of coolant which you might be able to see here. This little guy turned out to be quite the pleasant surprise. He is definitely gonna have a permanent home here aboard Athena. Let's move on to the wiring. This is everything I need to connect to get the system up and running. There's a relay here. I am pretty sure this is for controlling the fans on the fan heaters. Then there's the thermostat for setting the temperature here inside of the boat. And there is the PFC, the Pro Heat Function Controller. If I'm not mistaken, there are two cables I need to connect to the heaters. Itself. There's this one, which is power, and there's this one, which is kind of the control cable. We do have to make a small modification on the back of this plug here, so let's do that first. The reason I need to modify this little plug is because we want to use the CAN bus enabled thermostat and the PFC to control the heater. You can configure the ProHeat X30 to do a bunch of different stuff, which can seem a little bit overwhelming, but thankfully the manual is very thorough. Like for instance here, where they describe how to connect this CAN bus cable to the plug I mentioned before, and they do that in great detail. So we need to pull out this blue thing here at the front of the plug. As per the manual, I'm gonna connect these two wires here to pin eight and nine. Eight is gonna be yellow and nine is gonna be green. Eight is yellow and nine is green. And then we can pop the little blue plastic thing back in place. Now both of the plugs that are gonna go into the X30 are ready. Let's take a look at the other end of the power cable. I've got this little fuse kit with a regular ATO fuse. So let's get that connected to the power cable. I'm going to just temporarily wire everything up in the technical compartment. Then once I've figured out the layout of the uh, 
distribution panels and the stuff behind the nav station, then I'm gonna route everything to there. Let's pop in the fuse and that will be the power cable all sorted. Let's turn our attention back to the CAN bus cable because of course this needs somewhere to connect and that somewhere is this little plastic doohickey. Now I've already fitted the plug onto the thermostat but I still need to fit the plug onto the PFC. This is the little plug we need to connect and it comes with two different colors of wedge lugs. There's a blue one and there's a green one. The blue one is for a backbone and the green one is for a node. This is a CAN bus T connector. That's what's going to connect all of these funny triangular shaped looking plugs. It's got two connections for backbones. That's the little triangular shaped ones here. And it's got a single connection for a node. I'm going to add more thermostats later so that we can have one in the forward cabin and one here in the saloon. But for now I've just got one thermostat. So this setup here is exactly what we need. I've already connected up the thermostat here. The control cable from the heater connects to the other side of here. That leaves us with a backbone connection on the other side of the T here, which makes perfect sense. So that means for the last plug, we're going to have to use the blue wedge lug. If we consult the manual here, we can see that the yellow wire needs to go in this side over here. So let's connect that. And the green one needs to go over here where it says B. The last step is to add the blue wedge lug, which should just snap into place like that. And that is the PFC connected. I've connected the relay to the thermostat, so I'm pretty sure we are good to go now. Let's go ahead and get this connected to the heater. I have pulled the cover off of the heater and there's a yellow warning sticker here. Disconnect power to the heater during installation and until final when welding on the Yep, that's all good. Let's connect the control cable and then the power cable. Remember, all of this wiring mess is very much temporary. Let's get this thing connected to some juice and then we'll see what happens. It wants us to set the time zone, which here in Denmark we are UTC plus two. I just hit this button on the PFC and that's a solid red, which means the heater is active. There's a green light down there. And... Nothing. Okay, so I think I know why nothing happened. I set it into antifreeze mode, which I think we'll get back to that a little bit later. But the temperature here needs to be adjusted because I'm actually using it as a heater, not antifreeze mode. Okay. Sounds like we're about to take off. Oh. Yep, warm exhaust is coming out the exhaust through hull. It is a little bit loud. You might be able to hear a difference in the sound now. I think it's only the circulation pump that's running now. As you can see, it's an antifreeze mode. So I believe the circulation pump is about to shut off. You can modify all kinds of settings in the PFC, amongst them the startup temperature. As you can see, we've just dropped down to 100 Fahrenheit. I set the startup at 102 just to test it out. So uh, here we go again. Ah, oh, this is kind of interesting. Down there on the heater, you can see it's flashing and it's saying 03. On the PFC, we can see the same error code. It's saying 03 coolant flow or at least it was a second ago. In the manual, there's a more thorough description of this error. It says it indicates that the coolant temperature in the proheat reached 85 degrees Celsius within 60 degrees from the beginning of ignition. I can think of a couple of things that might be the reason behind that error code. For one, I've only got the heater in the forward cabin and saloon connected right now. So that means all the system's flow is gonna have to go through that somewhat thin PEX tube. As you can see, all but one set of the connections on the manifolds are shut off. And to improve the flow, I could just slightly open the summer valve just for testing purposes. The second reason I can think of is the fact that I'm not running the fan heaters right now. So there's a bunch of coolant hiding in that end of the system that might be pretty warm. So that comes back to the heater and it heats that up really quick and then we get that fault. But uh, yeah, let's do some testing. I fiddled around with the system yesterday. The heater has a bunch of different modes and settings but I only seem to get the O3 error when I'm in antifreeze mode 
and with the summer valve fully closed. The reason it would be nice to run the heater in antifreeze mode is because it doesn't continuously run the circulation pump. It runs it for a while and it stops for a while, which means a lot less hours on the pump. If I run the heater in standard mode, which runs the circulation pump continuously, I don't seem to get the O3 error. Also, if I run the heater in antifreeze mode, but with the summer valve just opened a little bit to improve flow, I don't seem to get the O3 error. That makes me think once I add more heaters, fan heaters to the system and I improve the flow, well, then maybe I won't see the O3 error anymore. The fan heaters are a little bit loud. I could definitely run those at a lower speed or maybe swap out the fans like I saw somebody did in the comment section in one of the previous videos. Speaking of loud, the ProHeat X30 does make a good amount of noise. It is the loudest heater here in the marina. But then again, it's also by far the most powerful heater here in the marina. My contact at Dometic did mention that the ProHeat might be a little bit loud. He also suggested some things I could do to combat that, like for instance, snorkeling the air intake to it. There's a little kit you can buy for that. And I have also seen that Shuremarine offers a little one and a half inch muffler for the exhaust, which I'm certainly could also help. And building a little soundproof box around the heater is also on the list. It's going to be difficult for me to to capture the exact sound level of the ProHeat X30, but this is the heater when it's off, the circulation pump is off, everything is off. If you can hear any kind of a background noise, that's the fans on the fan heaters. That is the sound of the circulation pump running. That's just to sample the coolant to see if it needs to start the heater. Oh, yep, here we go. That is the heater about to start. So... That is the sound of the heater running. As you might be able to tell, it's a little loud. I'm going to order the snorkeling kit for the ProHeat X30 and that little muffler for the exhaust from Shoremarine in the US. So that's gonna take about three or four weeks to get here, but the big exciting news is that I've finally got heat here aboard Athena. That's gonna make a huge difference when working on the interior over the winter. In the beginning of this video, I mentioned that I'd answer some of the more common questions I've gotten over the last couple of videos about the heating setup. But seeing as this video is already running kind of long, I think we'll just stick with one question. The question I think is the most interesting. And that is, why would you wanna go with a hydronic heating setup rather than using something as simple as a Dickinson or Reflex stove? Like I mentioned, I've used a Reflex stove as my only heat source aboard the 30-foot sailboat I've lived aboard for the last six years. I'd expect a Dickinson to be very similar to a Reflex stove. They work in the same way, so I don't expect there to be any big difference between the two. There are pros and cons to a hydronic heating setup and there are pros and cons to something like a reflex stove. If you're looking for comfort, then I don't think anything is going to beat a hydronic heating setup because the temperature is going to be thermostatically controlled and heat is going to be evenly distributed throughout the boat. Those are two things something like a reflex stove cannot do. For instance, aboard Oblix, heat distribution can be a little bit of a problem if it's cold outside. It can be sweltering hot in the saloon and still just a little bit too cold in the V-berth. And then the worst thing is if the temperature goes up during the night, five or 10 degrees, because the heat output from the reflex stove is gonna be the same, so then you wake up in a sauna. Like I mentioned, there are pros and cons to both types of setup. So over here, I've made a little list for the hydronic setup, and over here is something like a reflex stove. So for the hydronic, comfort is a big plus. It's also very easy to utilize the excess heat from the engine or the genset. The setup will also provide hot water for the galley and the head. Now the downsides are that it consumes a little bit of electricity and it can be a little bit noisy. Whereas for the reflex stove, absolutely no electricity is required to run the heater. It is also completely silent, but then there might be issues with heat distribution. You are gonna have limited use while under sail because if the boat is continuously healed more than, I think it's 15 or 20 degrees, then the regulator is not gonna work. And also there is no thermostat to regulate the temperature. As with most things here in life, I don't think you can have it all. I don't think the perfect solution exists, meaning I don't think you can get all of the comforts from a hydronic heating setup and at the same time have it consume no electricity 
and make absolutely no noise. So what you want to do aboard your boat might vary if it's a tiny boat and you don't want any kind of electricity consumption, something like a reflex tow might work well for you. If it's a bigger boat and you don't mind the electricity consumption and you would like hot water for the galley and for the head, well, the hydronic heating setup might be the best option. I think for Athena, the hydronic heating setup is definitely the best option. Once I've had a chance to run the ProHeat X30 for a while to see if I can get rid of some of that noise and also the O3 error, I'll post a separate little review type video. So far, I really like how small the heater is, how light it is. I also like how customizable it is. I like the ProHeat function controller. It's easy to monitor and configure the system. But above everything else, I really, really love the fact that I've finally got heat aboard Athena. After four winters of freezing my behind off, I've finally, finally got heat. Heat. And on that happy note, I will end this week's video here. Now, because of COVID, I am facing some difficulty over the next couple of weeks. From the 25th of December here in Denmark, everything except grocery stores are going to be closing down. So that means everything I need for the next few weeks here aboard Athena, well, I kind of need to get my hands on that over the next three days or so. I will, of course, do my very best to not forget to order something I desperately need, but uh, yeah, fingers. Crossed. Next week, I'm planning on installing the holding plate and the compressor for the fridge here in the kitchen island. Now that I've started consuming diesel from the diesel tank in the next couple of weeks, I'd also like to get an NMA 2000 network set up so that I can monitor how much diesel is in the tank. Of course, for that, I'm going to have to mount some marine electronics here at the nav station, like a chart plotter or a little multi-function display. So that should also be very exciting. Tonight, while you guys are watching this video, I'm going to be pulling out all of this junk here in the aft cabin so that I can start measuring and planning out the lithium battery bank. The battery bank is something I want to get started on a little further down the road, maybe in late January, something like that. So yeah, next week, fridge, and after that, some marine electronics. I'm gonna get busy rendering this video. I hope to see all of you guys back here aboard Athena next week for yet more DIY fun. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like. See you!